Welcome to another episode of The Roundtable. Today, we're going to be discussing the evolution of powerlifting. So how that's applied to each of us in our time spent in powerlifting. Um, we've all got different, I guess, lifespans that we've spent in the sport. Sam's been around for like, I think the longest now, like eight years, nine years. And then some of us yeah, should years. know how long have you been around? Uh, two. Two years? Yeah, okay. Two years, so yeah. We'll, we'll have like a range of perspectives on things we've seen change throughout the time that we've started essentially. Um, so first thing that I want to kick off is like, how has powerlifting for you guys changed since you started as a hobby to now as a career? Cause we're all coaches. Now we all have a different role in the sport where we're looking after people as well, rather than just doing it for ourselves. Um, so how has that changed your perspective on powerlifting? Sam, do you want to go on this one? Yeah, I'll kick it off. Um, I think as a whole, you know, from where I've gone, you know, when I first started eight years ago, it was more just dabbling in it, more of a hobby, more just like the thing I did on the side outside of my own personal training um, towards now where I'm a powerlifting coach and a, a competitive powerlifter who's taking it very seriously. So it's gone from very much like something I just enjoyed to now it's just part of my life and that's you know a career and my own athletic pursuits um so just in my own day-to-day I'm fully invested in it and I guess probably in that time I've seen especially from the coaching side of things be able to see like how much it's evolved over that time too um from my own learnings as a coach but also experiencing that as an athlete um so yeah I think probably for the most part just realized that it's something that you can take very seriously and, and have a career out of, whether that be, you know, as a coach, but then more so as an athlete side with, you know, more money being thrown into competitions now all across the world too. Hmm. Dave, do you want to go? Um, oh, sorry. Sure. Did um, you, uh, you want to keep going, Sam? No, it's good. Okay. Uh, so I guess like the biggest thing for me is like um, probably the amount of thought I've put into powerlifting as I've sort of transitioned from like, I guess more of a hobby into a career, right? So when I first started, I was running like five by five strong lifts in like 2016. And I was like, dude, this is the greatest program ever written. You just add two and a half kilos every week. This is so good. And then how it's sort of changed to being like, okay, maybe this isn't the best program. Maybe a linear approach isn't that great. And that's when DUP and RPE started getting thrown into the mix. And then I started like, I guess it was slowly becoming a coach and then thinking about, you know, when linear progression may be good for someone, when RPE, when all this sort of stuff. So it's, to me, it's kind of just been like this really big, um, I sort of like spiral into, I guess, trying to min-max powerlifting of like trying to be as efficient as we can be. And, you know, within someone's lifestyle and training and stuff, trying to make it as optimal as we can. Um, and I guess like drawing on all past experiences, both as like someone who enjoys and does a lot of lifting, but also as a coach as well. So to me, it's just been the, the amount of thought because like all I think about day to day at the moment is just powerlifting from like the minute I wake up, it's talking to clients about powerlifting to the moment I go to bed, it's, you know, writing programs or whatever it is. So it's just like more and more powerlifting as the, as the years go on. Yeah, I relate to that. Um, I think for me, like when, when it was just a hobby, um, I was already quite obsessive because I was coming from a place of, oh, I, I want to find something where I could like actually be really good at. Cause for me, I was like, I used to really like playing basketball, but you know, I'm fucking tiny. So I was like, I'd already obsess over that. That wouldn't turn out well. So I was like, okay, well, here's another sport and it can actually favor people in weight classes. So I was like, all right, how can I, how can I like maximize this? Right. So I'd always come in with questions asking my previous coach, like, why do we do this? Why do we do this? Why do we do this? And that kind of just evolved with like, okay, as, as I'm training, I'm also gaining a lot of knowledge. Um, and I think it just naturally progressed to a point where I was like, okay, um, I've, I've got a solid foundation of understanding everything just kind of makes sense. Um, and then it was, I guess, time to spread that to other people as well. But I think there was a very distinct shift and there still is like between being an athlete and being a coach when it's athlete mode, it's self-centered. 
um, almost selfish in a way because you are executing everything that you're um, trying to, everything that you've picked up, you're trying to execute for yourself. But then when you're, as a coach, it's different in the sense that you can only explain it so much and then it's up to the athlete to to do it, right? Um, so I find it's it's balancing being selfish and selfless throughout different periods of the day. Um, and now that, you know, I'm both athlete and a coach, um, day to day, it's learning when to change hats, essentially. Leanne, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. I guess um, similar to you, like coming from an athlete perspective and then just growing as I've had more experiences in the sport. So, um, you know, going from one coach to another, I've learned a heap of things from both. And I think it's just grown and evolved. And I've realized that, um, like, obviously I have such a love for the sport that I want to coach people into it and actually kind of help them along their own experiences um, and journeys as well. So yeah, there's, there's both sides where it's actually really uh, fulfilling to be able to help people along their own journeys as well. And actually, I guess everyone's a little bit different in how they, um, their experiences and um, yeah, their journey. So it's like kind of helping each person individually and it's never going to be the same, which I think is cool. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. That's kind I of relate with that. I used to think like, oh, everyone's going to be like me. I'm just going to tell them exactly what I've been through. And then it's like, yeah, they'll be in the same place, but it's, it's very different. Everyone starts at a different point in time. Yeah, like, exactly. As yeah. a coach, you got to meet them where they're at. Right. Very different. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I feel um, like mine's the opposite. Like I feel like because I am still so fresh in the sport as both like athlete and coach, it's like, when I started powerlifting, like I started powerlifting, I guess, during COVID. So like, it was like the big lockdown. So I sort of started it like with an online coach and like, I guess my experience being very like individualized, like it wasn't that like community or like that federation experience that like potentially Sam or Dave sort of had when they were first involved in powerlifting. So it was very like individualized. And then it sort of grew from there. Um, and I think as I progressed and like it started as like me just being athlete in the sport. And then um, I became a part of Perf Emotion. Like that was sort of the first community experience I had as like powerlifting being a sport and like having a community behind you um, alongside that being my first experience is like getting into it as a coach as well. So I feel like my learning is sort of the opposite where it's like DUP and like RPE and like how we sort of program now has been what I learned first. So like, my experience then has been like a lot of learning is not only like that just naturally progressing like with like PD and like our own sort of learnings with the team here at Perth it's like a lot of it has been learning the older strategies and just seeing what used to be done and like um, what that is like so bringing more of that potentially into my programming rather than the other way around as David said like signing with your basic like five by five and then his learning of coaching being progressed from there so mine's sort of been the opposite in a way um, which I think I've always said, like, I've been lucky where I do get like the best of both worlds where it's like, I started with how program programming is now. And then like my learning has been what it was in the past. Yeah. Interesting. And have like with you learning the more quote unquote old school ways, has that influenced the way you program now or because like in, in your eyes, you've already, I, I guess, like caught up up to date with how programming is so you could argue like there's no need to go back but do you see value in like learning about what programming has looked like and how it's evolved over time yeah I think it like it individualized it a lot more and sort of um I guess again like with my own clientele as a coach like I don't necessarily have to control a lot of the variables because a lot of my lifters obviously like the newer lifters so I feel like the way programming is now is that you obviously can control a lot more. So there's obviously RPE, but then because RPE is like the basis, you can then come in and control from like a, a lo load prescription sense, like working in, into percentages. So learning more about that, it's sort of like opened my eyes more to like, um, I've started in a way where I can just naturally let athletes go to actually find trends rather than trying to control too much. So I guess it's, it's allowed me to just like, yeah, look at programming just a little bit differently um, than feeling like I've had to like either, 
yeah, control everything from the start, if that makes sense. So it's like past and old school. It's like I can bring that in if I feel like an athlete will respond to it based on what we've done with RP and just letting them go. Mm. I think like with with the old school style stuff, right? Like back then, or not not just in my own experience, but like like you said, looking back at more old school trends, like Russian style programming, things like that, it was a lot more structured. Whereas now considering how everyone comes from different backgrounds, um, we don't have that same kind of structure where it's like previously where they're applying that to a certain camp of people, right? So you just apply the same thing and you can expect the results because they're controlling their entire life. Whereas now it's like, you kind of need to let things run organically because everyone is different. So it's, yeah. it's interesting to see how like different, I guess, like living circumstances, different experiences can just drive um training philosophies as well um because ultimately you're just trying to get a result like people that are training now might not be aiming for people for example like the bulgarian method right and although it's not like powerlifting olympic weightlifting that similar concept applies where it's like them as a team 10 12 people all aiming for like olympic gold right and then there's people that are like just trying to figure out the sport you don't need fucking singles every day 90 percent right so it's like different external influences influencing programming now i find that very interesting as well even like when i first started powerlifting especially in australia like in my first like two three years it was very much just like percentage and linear you know you did your three by ten your three by eight your three by six four by five four by four three by three two by two compete and it was just like you're rocking up to the gym, you're hitting that three by three at this percentage or you're failing, you know? And, and it was very much like that was like my first like three, four years in powerlifting. And that's kind of like what was just the thing in Australia, especially. I think we were like a little bit behind in terms of like that programming knowledge when, you know, RTS and Mike Shira released like RP and that became more popularized like overseas. I feel like Australia was just like a little bit f- further behind, whereas now probably across the whole world we're all on board with that more like individualized approach i guess you could say and it's kind of it's more it's more popular and there's certainly a lot more knowledge around like individualizing training um around powerlifting yeah i think dig digging on that like um there's certainly value in that old school approach like like you mentioned if you rock up unprepared, you're going to fail and you kind of know that. So it forces you to mm. be a bit more prepared because you know, oh, I'm hitting 90%, 95% today. So I gotta, I gotta like gee the fuck up. Right. I think I, I think there's yeah, value in that. <laughs> yeah. I remember have? like into a prep, I'd rock up to the gym and I'd like have this, I think it was like a single or a double on deadlift or whatever. It was heavy. I was feeling like shit. I remember i I failed it and I went home came back like a couple of hours later, just gee the fuck up, came back into the gym and then hit it again. Like I would, I would never do that. This <laughs> now, day. You, you know what I mean? Now. I would just like, I would just take what's there in the gym or I'd be smarter in terms of, you know, what load I'm hitting. But like three, four years ago, I was failing. I was going home, getting pissed, having a nap, eating up again, going back to the gym and then smacking it. <laughs> so, I mean, it can work. I mean, <laughs> There's like a certain level of like how powerlifting programming now is, is that it's like you have to be autonomous. Even if like, if you're face to face or like online, like, you know, we all work online with clients, like you have to be um, like autonomous in that sense as well. Whereas I guess the old school way of programming is that if you do know that it's like at X percentage or whatever, like you don't have to think about that. Like you just have to get into the right headspace to do your job. Whereas like now the first job is like actually like one being in the right mind frame, to like assessing your own warm ups without being like, you know, too, I guess, like obsessive with how you're feeling, how you're not feeling, being smart with your load selection, trying to stick to an RPE. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many more variables in programming now that you actually have to consider as both an athlete and a coach that some people can either just go like too far one way where it's like, like they freak out about how they're feeling. So then they're like, you know, potentially not hitting X load that you as a coach want them to hit or like vice versa. So there's yeah. like so many more variables that you have to consider as well now. I think yeah. there's pros and cons to that as well. Like I remember when I first started and it'd be like a set load 
always and it's like you're just going in the gym knowing okay I need to hit this load whereas now it's like you're coming in and you have to actually think about it a bit more rather than just being like oh yeah I'm just hitting this number and that's it yeah it's like whenever like clients always get really upset about being like low jail or like they're prescribed like me as a coach I'm like if you prescribe me like let's go I don't have to think about anything I just like walk in the gym I know what I gotta hit like prescribe me every day I don't give a shit like (laughs) I'll just go with it like that's fine yeah uh, but I yeah. think again, that's just because like I wasn't around back then potentially. So I wasn't around when like the percentage base was like used as programming. So like my experience of it is like minimal, whereas like I've always been, just been thrown into like the RP sort of like programming style of things. So yeah. yeah. I think there's a there's a healthy balance between it because with the load prescription method, like you'd have to plan out the next two, three, four weeks. So it kind of gave you like a bit of an idea of what to expect in the next four weeks, right? Whereas with RPE, like, especially the way that we program now, like we do it via like a weekly update, but that's not to say people can still program RPE eight, four weeks ahead. Right. But that number's not as clear. Um, So I think there's, there's definitely value that we could take from the old school approach. Like, like Sam said, back then it was like three by 10, three by eight, three by six. And it descend. When I first came into the sport, I was like very similar kind of situation, but I was like, training balls to the wall previous to that without any sort of structure. And then when that structure got imposed, I was like, holy shit, like I'm getting so much stronger because I was, I was genuinely training without like essentially Does being forced right? to order regulate. <clears throat> and um, yeah, like the going from essentially like doing whatever I want in the gym to that, at least some sort of structure was beneficial. I didn't even know what RP was back at the back then um and then now that i do it's like it's definitely been a very useful tool almost a staple that i use for everyone i don't know what i do without i don't know what i do without um rpe well it's hard. just to uh just to segue it a bit i think like that's part of the reason why you know we're getting so many juniors and like younger lifters now getting so strong so early is because like they're getting educated and like this kind of RP auto regulation individualized approach to programming is more popular and there's more knowledge around it. So like, I guess the pro can be that, you know, younger lifters are making riders or more correct decisions and getting like better programming for lack of a better term, which is like helping them get stronger faster. Um, and I think, yeah, that's like kind of a big reason why that kind of, shift obviously overall powerlifting is getting more popular but the knowledge around powerlifting and like smarter programming individual approach rp all the rest is like getting passed down to younger and younger lifters um who care about the sport too and they're kind of like putting in the time and effort to learn about their body and learn about these like programming principles and how they can get stronger faster and and healthier yeah i agree like you'd see a bunch of high school kids like you could now assume like some of them might actually be doing something that's um, progressive over time, right? Because they have access to the information. Um, they're training smarter, tra- not training in a way that's risking injury. Whereas previously, if like, if you're training with a bunch of bunch of your mates, you're just maxing out, mm-hmm. like that's not really conducive to long-term strength gain. Right. And I think yeah. to touch upon that, it's like how, what, what proportion of people stopped powerlifting just because they were taking that, that like, I got to hit this, otherwise I fail kind of approach um, and like getting hurt in the process and then just giving up on powerlifting altogether, right? Like I think we've made it, or not we, but I mean, powerlifting um, educators have made it a lot more smarter um, and and safer, I would say. Oh man, I was there. Like I was in a prep, like, you know, slogging it out failing lifts failing squats like week after week feeling injured and i had that kind of mental burnout where it was like fuck, i just don't want to keep doing this i don't want to keep failing because i had like this set number and it was just like do or die kind of approach to programming um and that's where probably my own development has really changed and that's probably why i'm still around now because i ended up you know going to kelly for the rehab and then we went through all these ups and downs of different style programming approaches but eventually found this way where I can keep getting stronger and making smart decisions and not having that kind of like mental burnout of like injury 
pushing, pushing, pushing and having no other option but to push. Yeah. I think that's that's kind of like an assumption that you pick up or it might have been something back in the day, right? Like if you don't hit this, your prep's going to go to shit because you're not getting stronger kind of thing. Whereas now mm. you realize there's so many factors at play. The fact that you're not showing up on this day could be like multitude of things, um, but it's not going to make or break of the prep because you can still adjust training variables to set you up in the next coming weeks. But like if you're looking at yeah. four weeks ahead, you miss week two, you're fucked. Yeah, it's I guess it's probably just that overall like problem solving aspect of programming that's really become popular, you know, like it's being more reactive and like looking at a person and chopping and changing things um to for them to keep progressing and not having that just like set target over a course of eight weeks. Yeah, agreed. Um where where do you guys kind of see like the way you could use that now or like do you still have some some instances of like things that you used to do that you kind of keep doing now? Because like even though we've got this new up to date approach RPE um, ability to change training variables on a week to week basis, things are much more flexible. Um, do you still see stru- uh, like value in creating structure around your training in that aspect? Because like. Me personally, I've I've got some people that still want to like know where they end up in four weeks, right? So you can still create a plan that gives them some sort of trajectory, but it's not so hard set, right? Whereas I think the the downside might be to like um to to just get stuck in like no, we only do uh, weekly programming updates, right? And that's that might be doing people a disservice because them not realizing that there's more to like training and it's leading to something. Um, I think that was a big takeaway that I would take from like, I guess what I used to do, um, like being able to have some sort of like delayed gratification to it. What did you want to um, touch in on? Shana? Oh, I was just going to say like, that's where in a way, like, again, just from my experience, like the way we program now, I wouldn't say it's a con, but it's like, it's where we see the big differences. Cause I find that I guess when you were just given a set percentage or like you knew where you were going to end up on, it's like you get to experience actually failing lifts. Whereas I feel like now with programming, um, like unless it's like a conversation that you have with a client or like an athlete that they ask you, it's like the experience of failing lifts and being able to deal with that from a mental perspective isn't there anymore. It's like, because we're so RPE based and it's like, you know, we're potentially along week to week up like weekly updating of programs and like still wanting to end somewhere the actual feeling of just like pushing as hard as you want whether you hit it or you miss it isn't there anymore if that makes sense because we're trying to control fatigue um I guess session to session week to week so I find that's like not that it's a con but I would say that's something that I talk a lot with with a lot of my clients because um and like even for myself personally like experiencing it like failing lifts obviously is a hard thing to deal with and the only way you get better at dealing with it is by failing lifts regularly and like being able to respond to it differently and that's one thing that I find that like you don't really get to experience much so that would be something that I would say um but like to actually answer your question it would be like I guess when it comes to like week to week and knowing where you want to end up on a block that just comes down to education around like how much load x lifter can either increase week to week um, in terms of like an actual RPE increase. So if it's going like, you know, your basic five, six, seven, eight across four weeks, if they know how much they can jump and how much fatigue, whether that's just like a linear thing or it's not a linear thing, obviously still have that sort of like, um, I guess, um, you're going to know where you're going to end up on the block. But I think, yeah, that's just like individual for everyone. But I find what you said, like that delayed sort of gratification and just, unless it's a block where you need to have that predictability, like into a competition, just letting things play out week to week is always like, I guess it's never a bad thing because it's just about like sort of like progressing every week, getting stronger, like feeling yourself getting stronger and things like that. Yeah. And I think to touch upon all of that, like you, and and we mentioned it very early on in the podcast is like, you do need to ensure that you as an athlete are autonomous enough to be able to acknowledge that going in. Right. And that's, I would say that's come up with the rise of like the fact that online coaching is so big now, like previously, mm. like when you'd look at online coaching, it's like, 
maybe a few Australian coaches might do it. And then you, if you are looking for online, like you'd essentially just might as well go to the American coaches, right? Because that's where essentially when it was old schools, like that's where you go for the knowledge because we weren't doing RP back in the day. Um, and I think now that, I mean, like post COVID era, right? Like unfortunately a lot of gyms closed. And I think with that came like dying of like communities. And with that, I would say like, I think that's also tied into a reason why like equipped versus raw and that that trajectory that each kind of um each division of the sport is taking like equipped is slowly um dwindling down even though it's still in world games like it's not as popular as it is now whereas like with with even the reason why Shania even came to the sport was like during COVID right like you are able to be a bit more individual barrier to entry you can still train at home if you if you need to. Um, so I think that's a huge region reason why Raw has blown up recently as well. Do you guys yeah, have definitely. any other um like any anything else that you feel like has kind of contributed to the reason why those two have kind of gone the way that they've gone? No, I definitely think um uh I'll jump in. I oh, my <laughs> You, so yeah, it's just they, a little bit. You it's just a little bit on. delayed. That's all. <laughs> uh, um, my vision was going to be um, the fact that it's it's actually quite um, I guess hard to access equipped lifting. So like, if you just join up to your local gym, ten bucks a week kind of thing, it's really hard to go from that to what equipped powerlifting is. But it's very easy to go into a commercial gym that just has like. Even if it's like, you know, crappy barbells, crappy bump plates with chips out of them, you can still powerlift on that uh, as like a raw athlete. So I think just the, in terms of accessibility, it's the fact that everyone almost everywhere can do raw powerlifting. And it often takes way more people to do equipped. One for like the safety reasons, because like people often lose balance or like misgroove in bench shirts and things like that. So you often need like, multiple spotters and multiple people around helping you in and out of the suit and that sort of stuff so it definitely relies more heavily on the community and being in a space people that have some sort of idea about equipped lifting and then because it's dying down anyway there's less people bringing i guess fresh people or new people into that space Whereas as raw powerlifting keeps growing, more raw powerlifters keep getting bought in, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like this cycle. Yeah. Have you kind of seen, you've you've seen it for the longest period of time, Sam. How have you kind of perceived things shifting? Uh, yeah, that's what I was going to touch on there. Just to continue on from David, I think especially it's kind of like that commercialized powerlifting, right? Like it's a lot more accessible now. Like there's more people who can powerlift in commercial gyms, especially in Australia anyway, you know, like, you know, your commercial chain gyms are getting calibrated plates, they're getting stiff bars, they're getting combo racks. Um, so in that sense, it's becoming a lot more popularized because of the accessibility, but also like social media, you know, like there's a lot of like Instagram powerlifters, um, people lifting big on Instagram, posting it. And, and a lot of like younger people see that and go, fuck yeah, I want to do that, um, which I think is great because it is driving a lot of popularity to the sport. Um, you know, you, you take the likes of Russ and Wheeze in America, like there's like so many 18, 19, 20 year old kids that want to be like them. So then they start powerlifting in a commercial gym, start focusing on powerlifting and strength training. Um, so I think it's just definitely been that shift in terms of it becoming more popularized, uh, online but also like more available in like a commercial sense um, and you can also yeah like we've already touched on do it anywhere you can do it by yourself um, you don't have to be strapped into a suit for four or five hours in a gym um, and I think that also ties in with what we've also spoke about like post-COVID like we've definitely seen this boom of powerlifting through COVID and after um, because people are taking it more serious because they can turn and take a career out of it. You know, like there's more and more online powerlifting coaches now because people have realized that you can make money coaching online. So I think that has also played a larger role to you. Know, like you get people 
quitting their day-to-day -day jobs because they can be an online powerlifting coach and they can train powerlifters and then they can attract more powerlifters to do the same thing, you know? Yeah. And it's just going to be another big old journey. A lot more people going through, going through that evolution, right? Do you guys ever yeah. see yourself doing a quit? No. No. Nah. Dude, I want to try rap so bad. <laughs> <laughs> just one time. <laughs> Just you were like probably the worst squat out of everyone and you want to try raps. Yeah, dude, I fold in half on a raw <laughs> squat. I would get destroyed in gear, but I just want to see what it's like. You know? <laughs> I tried I tried a pair of knee wraps with like 120 back in the day and it hurt way too much. <laughs> but Nothing like, compared to Inzas, huh? It was like air squatting. Imagine it was like 120. trying to get Sam into a fucking equip lifting suit. Yeah, nah. We don't need to stand on ladders and like. <laughs> yeah. It's hard, right? Like if, or if one of you guys pick up equipped lifting, you all have to pick up equipped lifting. Then you all, you all, need, <laughs> no. to, you all need to learn how to like wrap knees, um, lifting oh, suit, no. everything, right? Um, but yeah, I think, That's I think great. that'll, that'll wrap things off for today. Um, thanks guys for jumping on and listening to about uh, how powerlifting's evolved over our time in the sport. We'll see you on the next episode. Sweet. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Thanks.